do when a family member's DNA pops up as well being part of a crime scene long after they've passed? Maybe long after, you know, you've had a chance to, you know, you've, you've moved on, they've passed, and maybe you had a good thought about them too. Maybe they died and, and it was like, oh yeah, that's my uncle or that's my whatever. And he was a good guy. Then you find out, oh, according to DNA evidence, it kind of looks like he murdered his own kids. Ooh. That's uh, what is happening in Texarkana, Arkansas. I live in Arkansas, by the way. I think I've been through Texarkana. I don't know. I live in Northwest Arkansas, which is like a bubble unto itself. It's nothing like the rest of Arkansas. Uh, they've uh, finally cracked a, a chilling cold case that's uh, remained unsolved for four decades. DNA evidence has led them to identify Weldon Alexander, the father of the victims, as the prime suspect in the 1981 murder of his own children, Karen and Gordon Alexander. At a press conference held on October 19th, Texarkana Police Chief Michael Cram announced the major breakthrough. He revealed that Weldon Alexander is believed to have fatally stabbed his 14-year-old daughter, Karen, and 13-year-old son, Gordon, in a horrifying incident that shook the community. Tragically, the suspect... Weldon Alexander passed away in 2014, leaving a lot of unanswered questions surrounding the brutal crime. The events? Well, they go back even further. April 8th, 1981, when local authorities discovered the siblings in their Texarkana home, Gordon was found lifeless in the kitchen, while Karen, though grievously injured, was still clinging to life in the living room. Shockingly, the murder weapon was identified as a common uh, butter knife retrieved from Ouch. the crime scene. A butter knife. Uh, Ouch. Think about that. I mean, at least some of most of the serial killers that we've talked about, yeah. they're using some serious weaponry. A butter knife? Yeah. That was the 80s. Yeah. We all used butter knives to stab each other back then, you know? Oh, different different time. times, I guess. <laughs> Can't all be Brian Koberger, try allegedly. Not, try not to laugh. <clears throat> Karen was rushed to a local hospital where she fought for her life in a coma. For three agonizing days before succumbing to her injuries, as documented in a 1981 United Press International News report, Gordon at the time of the brutal attack was confined to a wheelchair, making the crime even more heart-wrenching. Initial investigations revealed a horrifying truth. Karen had suffered sexual assault in the 48 to 72 hours leading up to her death and had likely endured this horrific abuse for around six months prior. Authorities disclosed the disturbing details during a recent press conference. One of the perplexing aspects of this case was the absence of signs of forced entry to the Alexander's family home. At the time of the murders, Karen and Gordon's mother, Vera Alexander, was hospitalized for mental health issues, while their father, Weldon, was working an overnight shift at Copper Tire and Rubber. Weldon's account uh, of the events added to the mystery. He claimed that have arrived home from work shortly after 7 a.m. that fateful morning, finding both the screen door and the wooden front door slightly ajar. Inside, he discovered his son deceased in the kitchen and believed his daughter might still be alive in the living room area. Shockingly, he reportedly removed a kitchen knife from Karen's body and placed it on a nearby bookshelf before the arrival of law enforcement. Over the years, detectives tirelessly pursued leads and interviewed numerous individuals associated with the case. In 83, Henry Lee Lucas, a notorious serial killer known as the Confession Killer, falsely confessed to the murders. However, lack of concrete evidence prevented any charges against him and the case eventually went cold. Then February 2022, the case received new life when Captain retired Calvin Seward, who had been a patrol officer at the time of the murders, reopened the investigation. Over the next 18 months, he meticulously identified, interviewed, and re-interviewed individuals connected to the original case. Crucially, he submitted DNA profiles into the combined DNA index system, CODIS, for individuals associated with the initial inquiry. In a pivotal turn of events, DNA extracted from the victim's fingernail tissue in 2022 yielded results indicating a familial relationship with Weldon Alexander. Furthermore, Weldon's semen was discovered on Karen's bedding. Investigators <gasps> also uncovered evidence suggesting that Gordon had died hours earlier than initially believed and his body was cold to the touch when officers arrived at the scene. Captain Seward, speaking to reporters, suggested a horrifying sequence of events, stating he believes Weldon attempted to assault his daughter, prompting his son to intervene, resulting in a brutal attack on both siblings. In the press release, Texarkana police stated, it's our hope that he finds the remaining family of Gordon and Karen Alexander 
and they may find some peace in knowing that scientific and circumstantial evidence has been revealed sufficient to resolve this 42-year-old case. Miller County Prosecuting Attorney Connie Mitchell expressed confidence that Weldon Alexander is the sole suspect, suspect in the murder. She stated that if he were alive today, she'd be seeking an arrest warrant for two counts of capital, capital murder. Yeah, I mean, when this sort of stuff is done and they're dead, we got answers now, but it, it doesn't get prosecuted because what are you going to prosecute at this point? But Yeah, he's, he's dead. You know, I wonder if you couldn't just press charges just for symbolism. What what does that do though? I mean, is nothing. It, yeah. <laughs> well, what's the point at this point? They got looks like they got some answers. And it's interesting. It looks like uh Captain Kelvin uh Seward, uh, who is retired, he's using his retirement uh to follow, you know, some things that interest him on this case. Uh and so without him raising his hand saying, I'll give this thing the time. It's a cold case. Nobody's really ever gonna pay attention to it again. Unless someone like him raised his hand. Uh that's that's awesome that uh his his work and, and desire to bring justice has hopefully brought to some uh, closure to the family that still remains. You know, and there's people out there that, you know, we've, we've talked about law enforcement and things like that. And, and we are supporters. I know sometimes we, we tend to focus on some of the bad members, but there are people out there who want to make our communities safer and yeah. a better place. And this is a fine example of one of those people. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I support sanity. So yeah. if, if you're a law enforcement officer and you're sane and you're doing your, the right thing, great. I love you. If you're not, then I'm not so. But I'm like that with anybody. It doesn't matter what your title is, what your job is, this or that. Uh, I, I support sane. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of what it comes down to. But yeah, I mean, just... Looking at this and, and trying to think back, you know, all of that time, I mean, it doesn't even really talk about anyone who, uh, you know, knows them or or really it's like they just kind of, you know, sunk into history after this horrible thing took place. I do wonder about the mom that was in a mental health uh, facility in 1981. Uh, I, what I'm, and I'm not saying anything about the mom. What I'm wondering about is why was she there? And, you know, was mm. it legit? Was it you know, she wanted to be there or did the father, you know, make claims and literally put her there? There was easier ways of doing that in 1981 uh, than yeah. there are today. Uh, and, you know, some people would go and commit their spouses and move on in life and say, well, they're and then they don't get out. And uh, 81, I think the laws were a little bit better. But if you look back to the 50s, 60s, uh, even before that sort of shit happened a lot. Ooh, I just found out what happened to the mother. What? Oh, she uh, died by suicide in 1984 at the age of 37. Yeah. So it sounds like this family was very troubled. Yeah. Very, Ugh. yeah. Uh, just, you know, chaos uh, breeds chaos. But uh, thankfully for those kids, now uh, the answer to who took their life is is out there. Want to listen ad free? Want advance access to all of our interviews before anyone else? Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You get every episode commercial free. So you can binge on True Crime. Until you can binge no more. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts now. Or go to our podcast page and sign up now. More of the Hidden Killers podcast next.